Thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, I, I did note that this is the 35th year of the Skeptic Series. I believe it started in 1977, if I read my history correct. That's an easy date for me to remember. That's when I graduated from college. And I understand you've been shepherding this, uh, this series for 27 years, is that right? About. Okay. So uh, congratulations to you on a long, successful track record. I thought what I would do, because I was, I was told that there may be somebody sitting in the audience that wants to know, look, if I wanted to be CEO of a Fortune 500 company, what is it I would have to do? And of course, there is no set recipe to do that. But uh, I thought I'd give you just a little bit of glimpse, just kind of to clear that uh, into my background. First of all, Ruben wants to say in North Carolina, my parents didn't go to college. I was the first one to go to college. Uh, I went to a public high school. Uh, the only boarding school I was aware of were military schools. And the only people that went to military schools were the kids that got in trouble. And so that was, that was uh, my reference point. I applied to two schools, North Carolina State, Wake Forest. Wake Forest, was, and that's how complicated it was back then. You basically just applied to two schools. Uh, I didn't go to Wake Forest because that was my hometown. Thought I needed to get out of town, experience some things. And I thought I was half decent in math at the time. That's why I pursued engineering at NC State. I uh, graduated in May 1977, civil engineering degree. Uh, I started work three weeks later. And that's all I've done really for 35 years. Uh, the longest period I've ever had vacation, consecutive days, is 10 days. And my family will attest that even when I'm on vacation, I'm really not 100% there. I'm usually doing some amount of work every day because that is the nature of what a CEO does. Somebody said, well, you know, what is your job? I said, well, basically I'm accountable. I'm responsible and accountable for everything that happens at Praxair. Now, I have fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders of Praxair. That's my legal responsibility. But I have many stakeholders. We have the communities that we live and work in. Uh, we have, obviously, the employees of Praxair. I have the environment. So I have many stakeholders, one fiduciary responsibility. And so, you know, something can happen every day. I picked up an MBA part-time. Uh, I was on a career track with GE at the time and just didn't want to give up income uh, and the career path I was on to go back to school full-time. So that's, that's how complicated that decision was. I just went part-time. And when I was with GE, I moved, uh, I don't count it, but my wife counts it, I moved nine times in 21 years. So we moved the family nine times, uh, 21 years, and in GE, the moves were not optional. It's not like, would you like to go take this job somewhere? It was, this is your new job, congratulations, promotion, be there Monday. And that's the way Jack Welch ran GE, some of you probably heard that name. But uh, it wasn't optional with Jack Welch. He was managing your career uh, very closely. And I just viewed it all as an opportunity and an, and an adventure. So something we always look forward to. Uh, I never aspired to be a CEO. Truthfully, I never aspired to be a CEO. All I really wanted was to play a key role in whatever organization I was in. I like challenges. I like to learn new things. Uh, I was always conscious of what I left behind. And by the way, you know, we all leave a legacy, a legacy behind. You know, in any job you're going to be in, uh, you're going to leave a legacy behind. The question is, what do you want that legacy to be? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. And just to kind of simplify this thing, and I'll come down to one trait that I think is most important in all leaders. I'll distill it down to one trait at the very end uh, of this session. But, you know, I'm going to tell you some things you already know. We've got to work hard. Uh, you got to surpass expectations, not just meet expectations. A lot of people are going to meet expectations, but the ones that stand out are the ones that really strive to exceed expectations. And you got to take risks. Uh, I took risks with my career. I went from the commercial world, world, sales, marketing. I went into running manufacturing operations. I ran profit and loss uh, divisions. I changed divisions at GE. I was in electrical at one time, and I was in locomotive at another time. And then when I was on really pretty, I was in pretty good shape uh, with GE when I was uh, at the old age, I realized it's old, you know, 45 years old, I decided to make a career change, which was very risky. I went to a new company called Praxair, which I'm going to talk about. 
But that was viewed by many people to be very risky at the time. But obviously, you know, for me, it paid off. And, you know, people, we don't like to say things like this, but there is a little bit of luck involved. There's a little bit of serendipity involved. But if you do all the other things that I mentioned, plus the one that I'm going to tell you about at the end, I think you'll be in pretty good shape and on your way. So to, uh, you just want to hit that clicker. So I'm going to start off and just kind of tell you what Praxair does. Uh, one of the largest industrial gases businesses in the world, the largest in North and South America. Uh, our feedstock, our input to what we do is air. It's this air. And what we do through a cryogenic process, which basically means very cold temperatures, we liquefy air. And then we separate air out into uh, its components. And you can see the components. I think you've been in chemistry class, so you all recognize those components. What, per what percent of the air is oxygen? Very good. How about argon? Basically, after nitrogen, you don't have much left, right? So it's about 1%. And then the rest of the products you see up there, uh, xenon, krypton, and neon, are really rare gases that are in air uh, that we extract from the air. And you basically measure them in terms of parts per million. So those are the products. We get it from air. Uh, our power bill is $1.6 billion a year. That's what we pay in terms of our electrical power bill. Um, so the air is free, but as you can see, we use a lot of electricity uh, through the air separation process and then taking the gases that are extracted off in the distillation column at various boiling points. Each one of those gases has its own unique boiling point, as you've learned. Uh, but to do that and then to turn it back into a liquid form, we go from uh, air to gas uh, to liquid. And then we transported these, uh, you see that tractor and trailer there? It's got cracks here on the side, you really can't see it very well. You passed those on the interstate quite a few times, and you didn't recognize them. But I hope after today you'll go, hey, I remember that. Some guy came, the skeptics, and talked about uh, Praxair. So those are the, that's how we distribute. We build large plants all over the world. We build pipeline systems. We have some 3,000. Uh, tractor and trailers that look like that. And just to give you an idea, a basic cryogenic trailer costs a quarter million dollars. That's being pulled by that tractor. And then if it was uh, filled with hydrogen, it would be closer to a million dollar uh, trailer. So very special uh, types of transportation uh, handling uh, to carry uh, liquid products in that form. We're also involved in hydrogen. We make hydrogen. We take natural gas, and through a steam methane reforming process, we produce hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide. We, we basically don't make very little carbon dioxide. Generally, this is a, a byproduct from a chemical process, maybe an ammonia plant. We'll take that carbon dioxide, we'll purify it, uh, and then we'll use it for commercial purposes, food and beverage freezing, for example. Uh, and then helium. And uh, helium is recovered from natural gas formations. It's in the ground. It basically is uh, a result of uh, radioactive decay of uh, thorium or uranium. Uh, and you got to have to have special kind of formations where that decay that produces the helium gas can get trapped so that we can access it. Uh, but we are in the helium business as well, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the use uh, of helium. Yes, this is going. Everything's going? Yeah, okay. And these are the markets that those products that I showed on the prior page go into. Manufacturing is our largest market segment. You use argon, you use carbon dioxide, you use some other gases, you do a lot of cutting and welding. Uh, in the metals business, think about uh, steel, steel production. And just about every integrated steel mill around the world today, certainly any modern integrated steel mill, uses uh, oxygen. They cannot operate, they cannot make steel today without using oxygen. Uh, in the refining uh, industry, uh, uh, this is where hydrogen is used, and basically hydrogen is necessary to process the crude oil feedstocks and the transportation fuels. So you can't operate a refinery today without uh, large amounts of hydrogen. You can't operate a semiconductor fab today without ultra-high purity uh, nitrogen. 
photovoltaic uh, production uh, uses a lot of argon. Flat panel production uses a lot of uh, helium. Uh, you get to the healthcare market segment. You can imagine what product is used in hospitals. It's high purity oxygen. You've all seen it when you've been in the hospitals. And because uh, liquid helium is, is, if not the coldest known product, almost down to absolute, elephant almost down to absolute zero, uh, it's very close to it. And liquid helium is used to cool superconducting magnets and magnetic resonance imaging. And then I talked a little bit about carbon dioxide and nitrogen for food freezing. And then this is not a large market for us, but it's obviously very interesting. Uh, you use nitrogen and helium as inert in gases. They will not react with any other elements. Uh, in uh, space shuttles and in uh, some of those rocket launches that you see right there, and you also use hydrogen or a hydrogen mixture uh, as fuel source um, uh, in the aerospace industry as well. Now, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I think, you know, it's kind of interesting to show a chart that looks like this. And what I'm basically, you know, depicting here, a lot of people talk about Fortune 500 companies, they always base it on, on revenue dollars. And so, on the right-hand side, you can see sales dollars or revenue dollars, and every one of those companies is larger than Praxair, uh, some quite a bit larger. And I'll just draw your attention to the one right above Praxair, where you see Hewlett Packard, their, sa their sales revenues are $123 billion. They're 11 times the size of Praxair. But I just uh, looked at their market capitalization. Do you, do you know what market capitalization is? Go ahead. The percent, or how much money the company is worth, depending on I guess, how many shares there are. Shares and the value of each share. So price shares, say 300 million shares, $105 per share, uh, you get a $32 billion market capitalization. Hewlett Packard today is worth $28 billion. So this is a company that's 11 times our size, but price share in terms of market capitalization is worth more than Hewlett Packard. And so, our origin is we spun off from Union Carbide in 1992. Now, Union Carbide is a company that's now defunct. Um, but we went from a spinoff in 1992 to a company today that is, uh, in terms of market capitalization, in the Fortune 100. So in terms of revenues, we're right around 250 or so. But in terms of market value, we're about 100. And we, uh, this is our advertisement page that talks about you know, all the great things that, uh, that we do. Um, and I'll just kind of start in the center. You can see that Forbes magazine name is one of the 50, uh, I'll see if it works here. Yeah, the 50 most innovative companies worldwide. Uh, shareholder returns 16% over the past 10 years. So if you had, if you had invested $100 in our stock 10 years ago, it would be worth $441 today. That's what kind of return you would have had. So that's 16% per year compounded. You can see the comment there that we are carbon neutral. And basically, uh, when it comes to carbon emissions, carbon gases, uh, we, in, in terms of our process directly, we emit very little CO2. So there is some CO2 byproduct uh, in terms of producing hydrogen through that steam methane reforming process I described. But most of our CO2 credits, if you will, uh, come from indirect. Uh, emissions. And I told you earlier our power bill is $1.6 billion per year. It's a lot of electricity we consume. And a lot of that electricity, certainly in the United States, I think I think it's about 50% would come off of coal-fired boilers, which emit quite a bit of CO2 during uh, the process of converting coal all the way through to some syn gas all the way to, through to electricity. So basically, uh, we have a lot of CO2 liability, if you will, in terms of indirect emissions. Again, it's as a result of electricity that we purchase. But we fully offset that through the applications that we offer in the marketplace, which basically are around oxygen combustion in process intensive industries like steel and uh, in the use of hydrogen uh, to clean up uh, transportation fuel, remove sulfur particulates and the like uh, in the refining business. 
And then I'll move right into this, this one here you can see that says selected for Dow Jones Sustainability World Index for 10th consecutive year. So, and this is in the basic materials space. And all that means is you take all the chemical companies, all the steel companies, all the mining companies, fertilizer companies, every, all the companies that make commodities like that, uh, we're the only company out of all of those companies in that market space that's been selected to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for 10 straight years. Now, what does sustainability mean to you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, being able to maintain it, keep it steady. Yeah. Sustain it. Sustain our performance, however you define performance, over, uh, over the long term, right? What are some of the components of sustainability? What are some of the dimensions of sustainability? Like a consistent profit. You've got to make a lot of money. So financial performance is part of having a sustaining enterprise. What else? Happy employees. Pardon me? Happy, happy employees. Yeah. I'd say yes. Diversity is part of it. Good safety practices are part of it, making sure your employees are safe. We, we operate some dangerous processes around the world. Uh, good governance practices and good compliance. What the heck does that mean? It just means we have a well-structured company, very transparent, very compliant with all laws, and uh, that's viewed as good governance practices. So that's a measure of it. Uh, and also the one that people generally think about when I talk about sustainability is what? The environment. The environment, right? So that's where people's minds generally start. But I'm just telling you there are a lot of dimensions to sustainability. We're measured across all of those dimensions, even social policies. What are our social policy policies are one of the metrics that we're measured at in terms of sustainability. So a lot of it goes into it, uh, and we're very proud of our performance in that area. And you can see the, uh, the comments right there, 92,000 hours contributed to community engagement efforts which benefited 270,000 people worldwide and it's across a, across a whole host uh, of community engagement activities. All right, so now I'm going to switch around and kind of tell you who we are. We operate in some 50 countries. Uh, and you can see how our sales break down per region. North America is about 52%, South America 20 Europe, and so on. And you, you can see there are a lot of places in the world that we do not operate. Uh, we basically have a strategy of concentrating our investments uh, in places that we think we can build uh, a strong critical mass. What's a bit unusual about our company is the size of our footprint in South America. And 75% of those sales are in Brazil. So we have 4,500 people out of the 26,000 people in Praxair uh, work in Brazil alone. So we have a very strong presence there. Very unusual for, uh, for a company to have 20% of its sales there, but we're very happy with what we have. Now, in the upper right-hand corner, I gave you a little graphic the table that said that our revenues are, we're $4.8 billion in 2000. We basically doubled that over 10 years, and we're, gonna, you know, we're projecting we're going to double it again over the next 10 years. And you can see that the percent of our sales out of the United States is steadily declining. Now, that's not because you know, the U.S. is losing favor or not being successful in the U.S. In fact, if you did straight math, you would see that the U.S., that our, that this, our revenues from the U.S. alone continue to grow at a very attractive pace. The difference is we're just growing much more quickly uh, outside the United States than inside the United States, and that's why that participation level drops. Uh, another peculiarity of a company our size is we're very profitable. That's not what I really mean, but because we're profit, we have a lot of cash flow. And we invest about $2 billion a year in new plants, new projects all over the world. And more and more, uh, that investment and the growth that we're seeing that we're going to see over the next 10 years uh, is coming from outside the United States. Now, what I thought I would do uh, is kind of talk a little bit about what are some of the risks and challenges that we face uh, in these emerging countries where we're making all this investment. And I broke it down into three buckets, financial, legal, and operational. 
and I'll just take financial. And by the way, all of these risks and challenges I list here are pretty much over and beyond what we encounter in the United States. So I would love to invest more in the United States if the quality of the opportunities were there because it's much easier to do business in the United States than it is in a lot of these places that I'm going to be talking about. But that's where the growth is. More risk, very good return, but you got to manage your risk quite well. So the first risk is foreign exchange. And what do I mean by that? You know what I'm talking about when I say foreign exchange? Foreign exchange risk? Currency. Currency. Currency risk. So we do business in all these places around the world. Uh, and uh, you know our profits are in the local currency. That, in that country. So if you're in India, it's in rupees. If you're in uh, Russia, it's in rubles. If you're in China, it's RMB. If you're in Brazil, it's in the RIAI. So we do business uh, in the local currency. And then when we consolidate our profits, we have to translate that currency back to the dollar because we are a U.S.-based corporation. Our functional currency is the dollar. And I'll just give you an example of that. Ten years ago when I joined, 11 years ago when I joined Praxair, uh, the Brazilian RIAI <coughs> traded at four RIAI was equal to one dollar. So if I had a dollar, you'd give me four RIAI, we'd call it equal. Uh, ten years later, the RIAI had strengthened versus the dollar to the point that uh, 1.5 RIAI would purchase one dollar. So it has strengthened quite a bit. Now, what that means is we got a lot of tailwind in terms of our U.S. dollar profitability simply on the basis that currency, the currencies that we were invested in and getting returns in had strengthened versus the dollar. Now, one year later, that's already flipped all the way back around again. You know, today, the RIAI to the dollar is about two RIAI to the dollar. So the dollar has gained strength as there's been kind of a flight to quality around the world. And all I mean by that is, all you got to really remember, is whenever there's problems around the world, people take their money out of risky countries, and the money goes into, you know, where do you think the money goes? When people are nervous about investing around the world, where do they tend to put their money? <coughs> Gold and the U.S. dollar. And so regardless of how well the U.S. economy is doing, compared to the rest of the world, it's viewed as less risk. So the money comes back into the U.S. economy. So there's various ways that you can manage foreign currency risk, and I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go into all that. But that's one of the things we have to deal with when we're investing abroad and we we're running businesses abroad. Uh, inflation, if you think in terms of labor inflation, grows uh, anywhere from high single-digit percentages to maybe 15 to 20 percent per year in many countries around the world. So uh, if you go back 10 years ago, when we were investing uh, in China, an engineer at that time was anywhere from one-third to one-fourth the cost of an equivalent engineer in the United States. Today, the cost of that engineer is about the same. So the cost advantage of an engineer in China has basically disappeared. And that means we have to put more of a focus on productivity uh, to remain profitable when we have such cost inflation all over the world. And taxes, and I, I decided coming in here, I wasn't going to make taxes complicated because it's a very complicated subject. All you need to know about taxes is that we have one of the highest tax rates in the United States uh, around the world. Japan, I think, is the only one today that has a higher tax rate. And when we go invest in countries, I'll say Colombia, Colombia, South America. So if I invest in Colombia, South America, and I'm getting profits from there, it's taxed at that country's tax rate, Colombia, which is about 12%. If I bring those profits all the way back to the United States, I have to pay the difference between 12% and 35%. That is the tax rate in the United States. My competitors, Ehrlich in France, Lindy in Germany, uh, they don't have to pay a true up tax rate to their home country. The only taxes that they incur are the 12% in Colombia, uh, in their own, what they call a territorial tax system. So they have a natural advantage when competing against an American company because their countries uh, do not tax them at the same rate that our country does. So that's just a, something that we have to overcome, but it is a challenge. Now, obviously, if they're investing in the United States, they've got to pay the 35% tax rate just like we do. 
legal uh, corruption. There's corruption all over the world. And it's something that we have to stay far away from. And there's this little thing called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Any of you have heard about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? Mason, you've heard about that? I think so, I did. So basically what that said, it's a law that was passed in the 1930s that says if you're a U.S. corporation, uh, you are prohibited when you're doing business in another country, you're prohibited from bribing a government official. Now, it sounds pretty straightforward, but until recently, very few countries around the world had that law. So in other words, go back to my French and German competitors, they could bribe government officials in many parts of the world. We couldn't, we would be in violation of the U.S. law. They did not have Euro-based laws at that time. Now, they had to abide by whatever country's laws we were in, but basically they had a free pass on that for many years. Now, recently, everybody has ad adopted anti-corruption laws. China has an anti-corruption law. The Eurozone has an anti-corruption law. Uh, and uh, Russia has an anti-corruption law. But the difference is the U.S. Department of Justice is vigorously investigating and prosecuting anything they think that may be a violation of this law. And how many of you have heard about the Walmart, Walmart's problems in Mexico? That was bribery. They were bribing government officials. How many of you have heard about Avon, the cosmetics company, the problems they're having in China? That's bribing government officials. So uh, it is... Uh, can be a severe issue if you ever are indicted by the U.S. government because you do not want them helping you run your business. Uh, sovereign risk. All I mean by this is, is there a threat that that country is going to take over your assets? Are they going to expropriate, big term, are they going to expropriate your property? Uh, Venezuela has done that in the past. Ask the oil companies. Uh, Russia has done that. Um, so it's always a risk, something you got to be concerned about. We're not quite as concerned about it as if we were an oil company or maybe a, a mineral company, but it's something you always got to be concerned about. And selective enforcement, what do I mean by that? China has great environmental laws on the books, but they selectively enforce them. If you're a U.S.-based multinational, you better be in strict compliance with all, with all those environmental laws. If you're a, a state-owned enterprise or a U.S. or a Chinese national company, it's selectively applied. That's what we have discovered. Operational risks, infrastructure risks. Uh, the infrastructure in India is terrible. You know, you can't count on the power being on 24 hours a day. Uh, it's very difficult to move product uh, around India. How many, how many people here have been to India? Very difficult to move product around, as you know. Um, Brazil. What percent of the, of the roads would you say are paved in Brazil? Five. Five. Five percent of the roads in Brazil are paved. It to move product to move product from us, moving 2,500 miles, basically coast to coast in the U.S. takes 17 days if we're trying to move product up the Amazon to a place called Manaus, where we have a, there's a large automotive plant. 17 days, it'd probably take two to three days to move the same distance in the United States. Uh, Russia. Uh, the Volga River transports a lot of product into the heart of Russia. That's how you move a lot of equipment into Russia. The Volga River is frozen seven months a year. So you got a five-month window to get your equipment ready and on that barge and up that river before the river freezes. So that's, so that's some of the complexity that we experience around infrastructure around the world. Now, the U.S. has outstanding infrastructure, and you take that for granted when you live here, but you start going to other parts of the world, and you realize how important having a good infrastructure is to an economy being able to progress and to develop. China has outstanding infrastructure. And I think that's one of the first things they did, and they did it quite well, was develop the road system, the highway system, the ports, the petrochemical complexes, the rail systems, 
power, electricity, you name it, and I think that uh, had a lot to do with how attractive it became as a destination to invest in China. Construction. Constructing plans are very difficult. Uh, in Russia, you have construction cartels, which basically means they get together and fix the price. And uh, you can't do much about that. Uh, you can try at your own risk to do something about that, but it's just something you got to understand. Safety. Safety is a core value in Praxair. I said it's part of sustainability, right? The value of a, a human life is not as appreciated around the world as it might be in places like the United States and other parts of the world. So we have to be very vigilant uh, and very diligent in terms of insisting on our safety practices being the same no matter where we operate around the world. Security. Uh, if you're in Rio de Janeiro, you've got to be concerned with security. If you're in Monterey, Mexico these days, you've got to be concerned about security. If you're in the Mideast, you have to be concerned. If you're in Russia, you have to be concerned. And so, you know, these again are challenges, these are risks that we do not have uh, in other parts of the world. Shortage of engineers. Uh, this isn't unique to emerging countries. The U.S. has a shortage of engineers today. And you're hearing a lot of talk about STEM. And you know, I think you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Brazil has a big effort on uh, coming up with or, or graduating 100,000 STEM students over the next, I forgot the time frame, X number of years. It's going to take some time. But that is a big focus of President Rousseff is graduating more engineers in Brazil. Why? She needs them to develop the infrastructure and develop the manufacturing and industrial base and develop all those petrochemical resources they've discovered. It's very important to the future of Brazil. Bureaucracy. Uh, two most bureaucratic places I can think of are India and Russia. Uh, they say that, you know, one of the greatest things about, uh, I know I'm hitting some hot buttons in there. Uh, I'll change subjects in a minute. But they say that, uh, you know, in India, one of the greatest things about India is you have democracy, and one of the worst things about India is you have democracy. <laughs> And so it just creates a lot of log jams, a lot of bureaucracy. It's very difficult, even for native Indian companies, to get some simple things done. Uh, and that's something that needs to be addressed. I think the Soviet, the old Soviet Union perfected bureaucracy, though. Uh, as I look at what we're having to do to invest in Russia and some of the permitting and regulations, and it's just, it goes on and on and on. There's a lot of bureaucracy uh, in Russia. Commercial complexity. Uh, if you're going to do business in Russia, you need to go first to the Kremlin and say, this is what I'm thinking about doing, these are the people I'm thinking about working with, investing with, these are my partners, and they'll basically kind of give you the up or down that you're working with the right people. So you can't go straight in there like you would in the United States and start working with customers. You need to navigate through the government. you got to do the same thing in China. The local municipalities are heavily involved in commercial transactions and relationships uh, in a place like China. Um, in the U.S., we rely a lot on contracts. We rely a lot on legal documents. We take a lot of, uh, we have a lot of confidence when we have a legal document that we can rely on. Uh, it means something in the United States. In many parts of the world, it's just a beginning. And in the relationship aspects are much more important than the actual physical document that an American company tends to put a lot more credence into. It. So uh, those are some of the uh, the risks. And I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop right here. I have other things I could share, but I'm going to stop right here and make sure you got a chance to ask questions. I can see we have no short questions. I'll start with this young man. You mentioned the risks, risks and challenges you face, but what's one great risk that you take in that headed poorly? One great risk I take? How much time do you got? <laughs> uh, 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 I didn't know this was self confession. But no, I would say uh, I've made an acquisition, bought, uh, bought a company that I thought I understood that marketplace very well, and what happens is 
you can get a lot of smart people in a room that can go study things and analyze things. And they'll come back and say, this is a great investment for you to make. This is a great market space for this to invest into. In this case, it was a healthcare, home care company. And uh, we thought we were all smart people. We went and invested. We found out we didn't know near enough about what it took to be successful. And so my advice, and what I would do, what I do differently uh, whenever I encounter something like that, I start picking up the phone and I start calling people that I might know and asking, do you know people that know something specifically about this space? Because I want to get as many different perspectives from as many different places as I can because you always learn something when you go when you make that extra phone call, that extra contact. And a lot of times it's a critical piece of information that prevents you from making a big mistake. So, you know, you got it, it's kind of like you're sitting in the class, you got your little team there, and you, you guys come up with the answer and you think it's done. Well, there's probably a lot of there's probably a lot of other people you should have asked for some information, gone and canvassed to get some additional information or data that would make your project or your answer or whatever it is better than what you came up with as a team. So get outside of your network and challenge your assumptions. That's why. So I'm going to start back here. I'll come back to you guys. Go ahead. What's the profit margin on something like hydrogen from when you produce it to yourself? All right. So uh, the profit margin on hydrogen is about 20% operating margin. So after all variable costs, purchase of natural gas, processing costs, fixed costs to run the plant, all the overhead, I'm left with 20% operating margin. Profit. Uh, so I'm from Russia, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are. I assume somebody yeah, had. We are. Uh, Where in Russia? Moscow. We are obviously very. Now big. that's one of the best places to work. <laughs> <laughs> A very big player in, in gas uh, business, and uh, which business? Gas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's a huge part of our economy. Yeah, natural now, gas. Needless to say, people, their uh, companies are starting to get uh, worried uh, because of shale gas. In the U.S.? Yes. Uh, and that the U.S. basically, in the last 10 years, became much more sustainable in terms of gas than it was before. Uh, and, but uh, I've heard a lot of things, and I think it's, it's a known fact that shale gas extraction is, is not very good for um, ecology, for environment. Um, so I would just like to ask, is I would it, never let that stop us. Is it worth, uh, is the, uh, do the uh, economic benefits, uh, they outweigh the uh, environmental harm that can be caused by Well, I don't, I'm not an expert, uh, but I do provide, in one of, the, one of the applications of our products, liquid CO2, liquid nitrogen, uh, we do inject what they call downhole under very high pressure, and we frack natural gas formations, uh, and we also frack uh, shell gas formations to access natural gas and access oil. So that is, we're not a driller, we're not a developer, that, that is a business that we're in. But I look at the shell gas in the United States, and I think it's one of the biggest booms that's happened to this economy in at least a decade. Uh, and through great technology. I mean, they basically innovated this horizontal drilling technology. Basically, they run a pipe down, and then they go out in various radials, and they can go, you know, long distances and keep fracking, you know, to access uh, not only natural gas but also oil. So it's a big boom to the oil industry as well as the natural gas industry. Uh, but you know, electric, electric power costs have come down in the United States. Every other place in the world, electric power costs have gone up. And why is that? Because more and more power is being produced from natural gas in the United States. And that drives down the cost of electricity, which benefits everybody that uses electricity in the United States, which basically is everybody. So yes, I think it can be accessed in an environmentally friendly way. Uh, I think there are some incidents of water contamination and so forth. I think they're few and far between. I think states are finding that out, and I think they're scrambling to be able to get the benefits of trapped shale gas, trapped oil, you know, in their states. So I think this is something the United States should grab onto with both hands. Because as you look around the world, every country around the world is concerned about energy security. Some of them are concerned about carbon gas, uh, about climate change and greenhouse gases. Every one of them is concerned about energy security. I think the additional benefit of 
natural gas, as you know, the carbon footprint is about half what it is of coal or oil. So you have something much more, you have an energy source much more environmentally friendly, very efficient energy source, and guess what? It's in the backyard of the United States. So what's wrong with that? Sorry for the long answer. Um, at what time period did Faxair create a publicity campaign for environmental uh, clean energy, and how tough were clean energy activists on you guys? Well, you know, when you're when you're basically when your feedstock is air, what's there to complain about, right? And so, um, you know, in terms of a campaign, and, and I'll, I'll just be very honest. You know, a lot of things we put up there, they look good, it's green, but we do everything because it has a good business rationale behind it. I say my fiduciary responsibility is to the shareholders. So, you know, I don't deliberately spend my day trying to promote green technologies or that we're greener than the next company. I do it because it's good business. And the employees like it. Employees very much in, uh, like to be involved in their communities. Um, everybody wants to work for a company that's, that is a good steward of the environment, a good steward of the resources they use. But if it ever ended up being not good for business, then I'd have a dilemma. But today, all those things that I described are good for business. So the public relations campaign probably started... Um, <coughs> It wasn't a big public relations campaign because these, these sustainability indexes, there's several of them that exist, and they basically come find you. Uh, or they have kind of an open application form, and then you can look at the, the criteria, and you can decide whether you want to apply or not. And uh, fortunately for us, we've applied to a lot of them, and it's made, uh, and it, we've been able to, you know, be recognized for doing that. But it wasn't like, you know, one day we woke up and said, this is some big public relations campaign, we need to spend a lot of money to do it. It kind of happened one at a time, and it kind of built upon itself. But again, we do it because it's good for business. Could you say, um, because Fraxar is involved in so many different aspects of the economy, like many different industries, um, would you say that the growth of your company is a good indicator for how healthy the economy is? It is, uh, but we grow at a rate faster than the economy. And the reason that we do is that we participate in things like um, CO2 and nitrogen to recover shell gas. And again, you know, shell gas, shell oil wasn't something that really was around five years ago. So this is like something that's additive to our growth rate. We basically look and say we're kind of an industrial production rate company. So whatever the industrial production rate is in the United States or any other country around the world, that's what we grow at times some multiple. And the multiple is dependent on where these countries around the world are in terms of their own economic development. So what happens over time is uh, as economies modernize, people want carbonated beverages. Well, that's CO2 in their beverages. They want higher quality welding, uh, which requires a lot more industrial gases to perform that. They want a cleaner environment. To get a cleaner environment, uh, to clean up wastewater, you need oxygen. Uh, they want uh, cleaner air. To get cleaner air, you'll substitute oxygen for air, and now uh, you don't have nitrous oxide uh, as part of the uh, pollutant. And you also reduce the amount of energy that you consume. So as countries become more conscious of their environment, as they want to modernize, uh, as you have a developing middle class, they require more industrial gases. And so basically we grow at a rate, some multiple of what the industrial production rate would be for that country. Okay. Okay. You said you've had, a, if I recall correctly, you have 20% sales in Brazil. Um, how, it's not very, uh, how do you maintain such good sales in a country that's not as strong for sales? Probably? Yeah, we have about 75% market share uh, in Brazil. So it's unusually high. Uh, we have a, the company we operate there goes by the name of White Martins, and it's about a hundred year old company. So we bought into this company in the last uh, 30, 40 years, starting Union Carbide, until we bought out this company. So started the partnership, and then we bought it out. And uh, you know, when you have a, a position that dominant, 75 percent market share, you have revenue that high. And obviously, as you look around the world, we don't have 75 percent market share anywhere else. In the United States, which is one of our strongest uh, regions, our market share would probably be 30 percent. 
what's that? What's market share? Yeah. What made you take the risk to leave your previous job and join Praxair? I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a that's a good question. Um, so I had been a GE 22 years. Uh, I kind of liked it, and you knew we'd probably be moving some more. Um, but uh, it was one of these things that I had a good feel for the company. I had had uh, multiple dinners, dinners with the previous CEO, and it's something that I kind of went at very incrementally, and it just felt right. It felt like, you know, it was a prudent risk to take. And I'll give you a little, uh, I told you I'd give you some free advice. Here's a little advice. So when I left GE, I had a lot of people that I left behind at GE. And they would look to go make a move to another company. Uh, and they would call me and say, would you mind being a reference? I'd say, sure. And then they'd say, well, I got this opportunity. And they'd be pretty excited about it. They'd say, well, it's this salary. It's this uh, title. You know, I do the job a couple of years. I become this. I become that. And uh, they said, what do you think? I said, you haven't told me a thing. You haven't told me one thing. I said, what are the people like you're going to go work with? Because you're going to roll up your sleeves and work with these people, you know, 12 hours, 10, 12 hours a day, whatever it is. Do you like them? Do you trust them? Is the chemistry right? Because if those things aren't right, six months from now, you'll be looking to make another move. So the chemistry was right for me. I did a lot of diligence looking into what kind of company it was, what the culture was at Praxair. And I had to make a determination that I think this is a place I really want to go work and go work hard and work with these people. And the answer was yes, it felt right. Yes, sir. Um, if it's not inevitable, um, I just wanted to ask you, being a, such a small man with such an enormous responsibility, running a very productive <laughs> business, having eleven million dollars in income, what is the feeling that you have when you wake up? I got a lot to do. What, well, the question is, when do I wake up? And so, you know, there are nights I wake up in the middle of the night. And I go, I got, you know, I got some things I need to work on. So you can get an email from me any time of the day, anywhere around the world. Um, but, you, you know, this sounds kind of cliche, but if you have great teams, and if you work hard to get a great team, uh, it makes your job a lot, lot, lot easier. Uh, and if you don't, I don't care how good you are, you will not succeed. So it really comes down to the people that you uh, you have in the company, where you place them, how you manage their careers, how you develop them, and having the right people at every critical job, you know, there's no substitute for that. I'm going to go to the back. Can you go back to that one for a minute and talk about um, as we look forward the next Yeah. So I think what what you'll see, you know, change is uh, I for all the negative things I said about Russia, I do like Russia for our company for a lot of reasons. Number one, it is very heavy in natural resources. Uh, it has some of the best steel production in the world. Um, and it looks to me to be an area that it's a little bit like the wild, wild west in the U.S. days. But if you get in there, you figure out how to do business, you work through all these challenges, you learn how to manage them, you can do exceptionally well. So I'm very optimistic. You know, one of the major customers we have in Russia is a company called Evrox. Which doesn't mean, it might mean something to you, it wouldn't mean anything to anybody else in this room. But Everott's is owned by this guy, Abram Abramovich. You heard about him? Yes. He's an oligarch that owns the Chelsea soccer team. Uh, I think he has the largest yacht in the world with some crazy game like that. But he owns <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of the major investments we've made is with his company, and it's just west of the Ural Mountains. And it's, you know, it's something that's exciting, it's something that I worry about too because I just don't have the deep operating experience on the ground yet. But the Mideast, we're going to end up doing a lot more in the Mideast than we have to date. We're kind of making our first steps in the Mideast. Mideast is another place that has a lot of natural resources. They have a ton of money. 
places like Abu Dhabi, uh, I think the Sovereign Wealth Fund has something like $1 trillion in it. And they want to develop more downstream uh, investments. They just don't want to take the gas and oil out of the ground and send it to other parts of the world. They want to develop downstream industries. Petrochemical complexes, steel industries, <clears throat> chemical industries, and the like. And so the problem with that today is uh, there's a lot of risk in the Mideast. And a lot of people are just afraid to pull the trigger on some of these major projects because of all the things you read about in the paper. But I think we'll have much more investment in Saudi Arabia. You can see little dots there around the Emiratis you know, than we have today. As far as Africa, very small economies. We've looked at South Africa. We're a bit blocked out by our competitors today. Uh, it is something I'm intrigued by. I'd like to get some business going in Africa. We do have some products you know, that would be very helpful, uh, you know, to the people there. Uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen for water treatment, and so I'd like to find a business rationale uh, to get a business started in certain parts of Africa. Uh, but it's been some tough sledding, uh, you know, to find the right opportunity today. So I don't think Africa is ever going to really move the needle for us, not in the next 10 years. You're probably out further than that. But certainly Asia, Russia, the Mideast is where you'll see a disproportionate amount of growth. Yes, sir? Earlier in the presentation, you discussed about the tax rate, and that's one of the reasons other countries might, I mean, other companies might not invest in the U.S. because of the 35% tax rate. Is it the American economy, or what's, what uh, has controlled the tax rate for the U.S.? The government. Now, you know, we have a 35%. We pay basically the 35% tax. We don't have these loopholes that we jump through that a lot of companies do, like GE um, and some of the other companies like that. So we pay the full tax rate. I think some of the proposals on the table were to go to more of a flat tax rate and get rid of all the exemptions, which would benefit us. It means our tax rate would come down. A lot of other people's would go up. Um, but kind of while you're on that subject, you know, you hear a lot of businesses complain about regulations and high tax rates uh, and things like that. Um, I really don't think that's the issue today uh, in the U.S. economy. I think the U.S. economy is really suffering more today from a lack of confidence. And if you think about it, you know, there was this economist, his name was Zandi, that he was on some talk show, and I laughed when I heard him say this. He said, well, these Corporations have made all this money and they're just sitting on the cash and not investing it. They need to invest it so we can get jobs. Now, first of all, the cash that we have, where did it come from? From investing and taking risk in all those places around the world. That's where the cash came from. And I would love to invest more in the United States. Go back to all the challenges that I showed you. Those are all things I got to deal with. We have to deal with when we go overseas. So I would like nothing better than to invest in the U.S. A lot easier. But you got to have, you got to see the demand. The demand has to be there. The prospects for demand have to be there. And for that to occur, there needs to be more confidence in the economy. I think if the consumer is more confident, if businesses were more confident, they'd invest more. When they invest more, you get jobs, and it all solves itself. But today, I think it's more of a crisis of confidence than. The tax rate is too high, too much regulations, all those things. I think that really, uh, you know, is the problem today. Well, let me see if anybody else got a question. Maybe one, one or two more questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, what's your transition from being an engineer to a businessman? Is that sort of a natural transition, or did that take a lot of work? I just wasn't a very good engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't take much work. Uh, no, I, I, I said earlier, I... Um, Engineering was great to get a job, and back then there weren't a lot of jobs coming out of college. Um, but I like to do different things, and so that's kind of what, that was more about me liking to do different things, different challenges, learning different things, that's all that was. So it was kind of a, just an evolution. It wasn't deliberate. Uh, in Russia, there is, uh, I mean, there's an awfully, in, in the gas business, there is uh, gas company, problem? Yes. And it basically has a sim monopoly in, in, in the country. And is it, uh, how far is it going to be to uh, 
grow in, inside Russia to, uh, with basically yeah. the established So the industrial gas industry, which is really in its early stages, is not on the Kremlin to regular spring. Like gas would be, or oil would be, or maybe some of the rare material, uh, rare metals that they have, natural resources. So we're not really on the radar screen. We operate just below the radar screen. So when I invest with a company like Everods, as long as Everods is in good stead with Kremlin, you know, we're in good shape. Sabor is another company that we invest with. Uh, we're not doing any business with Gazprom today. Uh, and I would be nervous if I was, because I just don't want to get that close, you know, to be on the front desk you know, with people sitting in the Kremlin. I kind of like the position we are and uh, keep our head down. I think that's the best way to go. Last question. We got, what's your name? Kyle. Kyle. Does Kyle get the last question? Go for it. Go for it. Earlier you said that your company has a lot of community service. Can you explain a little more depth what is that All right, so, so basically, we want to be good citizens, citizens of the places that we live and work around the world. And when it comes to dispersing our corporate funds to support community engagement practices around the world, one of the first places I look is outside of the United States. And why is that? There's a lot of people that contribute inside the United States. But you go into places that we operate in India, places we operate in parts of Mexico, and China, and Brazil, um, there are some people in villages and communities that uh, are in desperate need. And what I found is a little bit of money can go a long ways, and we actually feed a village in Brazil. We have a farm, we, we, we tend and we feed people in Brazil. We have uh, a medical clinic that we operate uh, in India. We have a program where we provide uh, meals uh, to children in India. Uh, and again, this is very good business. Uh, it builds a Praxair brand in a part of the world that I'd like to build a brand. That money goes a long, long ways towards helping people further than it would in the United States. And the employees there love it. They love to be part of something other than just a corporation that makes a lot of money. They want to be part of a company that actually is a good citizen and helps communities that they live and work. So, you know, we, I, I just don't do this just because, gee, I want to do community engagement. We do this because of all those reasons that I described. There's a lot of good business. You, don't, you shouldn't have to think you've got to disconnect you know, being a good steward of the environment or being a good citizen of the communities you live and work from good business practices because they're one and the same. Thank you very much. Very good.